fellow investing friends, friends of financial freedom, welcome into Investors Club. Got a great show for you. Got a huge show for you. Got to show uh, congratulations. Congratulations to Madrigal uh, Investors got on the first approval in Nash Mash. Uh, we're going to talk all about Nash Mash. And uh, we're going to see, well, we're not really big fans of their treatment. And we're going to explain how the treatment works and say, yeah, it's kind of interesting. But it's not really, there's a couple of reasons we don't think it's the best treatment. And, uh, and it doesn't, when, when you actually need a treatment, if th their treatment is not an option. The, and and Galt's is. And it's because of fibrosis. And fibrosis is a bit, we're going to see how what a big topic it is, what a big target it is in all kinds of diseases. And that their, uh, their therapy, galactins, actually works to do some reversal, it seems, or at least stopping uh, the fibrosis uh, when, you, when you actually need the help later in the, cirros in the cirrhosis when you actually need the help. So we're going to talk about how Alt, uh, Alt Immune uh, and Viking, how their therapy, which is, uh, remember we always talk about how this, it's one big ha-ha disease, uh, obesity and uh, diabetes and the liver problems. It's one big disease. It's too much McDonald's and too much sitting around. And that is, it's, so you, those, those, it's, it's one big overlapping thing. And so you, you, when, you, uh, when, you, when you have too much uh, fructose, for example, fructose goes straight to the liver and the liver can only store so much uh, glucose. Uh, you can only, only store so much sugar as glycogen. And then when that fills up, it spills over and starts storing fat. And you store too much fat and you start getting these uh, liver problems. Okay, and so we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about how Madrigals works. We're going to say that Alt Immune and Vikings drugs, uh, are, so they're, 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 they're good because they take the sugar out of the liver, and then they are also GLPs, they're combos. And so uh, they do the glucagon and the GLP-1 combination. We're going to say those are better therapies earlier on, like Madrigal is earlier on. And then uh, we're going to say later on, or even 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 as the fibrosis is developing, both early and later, later when you really need it, uh, you can use Madrigal's drug, and you can use it in a number of other diseases. And we're also going to see how cassava, it had their, it did this fibrotic component, yes, the, we're going to see the extracellular matrix. Wait a minute, extracellular matrix, it doesn't that have something to do with the filament A and, uh, and, and things like that? Yes, and, and, and specifically, filament A is shown to be overexpressed in NASH, and it's a target for cassava. And we're not saying they're going to pursue it themselves. We're going to say, see that for both galactin and cassava, all of these other indications point to a buyout. They're only pursuing, because Mar Mad or galactin is, only, is in uh, trials, clinical trials for NASH and uh, melanoma, and cassava is just for Alzheimer's. We don't think they're going to run trials on other things, but we do think they're going to get taken out because big pharma sees the other optionality of all that stuff. Okay, let's dive in. Got a big, huge show here. Okay, congratulations to uh, Madrigal on the approval. Congla congratulations to Madrigal on the approval. Uh, not only did they get approved, but they were they were down a lot on the they had gone up a lot over the past month in anticipation of the approval. Went down a whole bunch on the approval. Went up a lot in the in the post market. Went up, didn't go up nearly as it went up only as half as much when the market opened. But the reason it went up so much on the approval is or after after it went down on the approval and then afterward on the call it went up a lot because no biopsy the, the labels. They got a really favorable label, so you, you can just prescribe this drug. Somebody doesn't have to get a liver biopsy before getting prescribed this drug, and so that's a good thing. Uh, and so it is, and it's we're going to see the stages of NASH. This is uh, moderate to advanced, so F2 and F3, but it goes to F4 and cirrhosis, and they, they can't help you there. And in these earlier stages. Uh, maybe you don't, maybe this is not the right therapy is, is what we're going to say. Okay. Well, why don't you like this therapy, Joe? How does it work? Thyroid. Okay. So, uh, I went, I met this girl once and she was really uh, pretty and really skinny and kind of hyperactive. And she said that she had uh, an overactive thyroid. And that was my first thing hearing about thyroid. And so an unexplained change in weight is one of the most common signs of thyroid disorder. Uh, if the thyroid produces more home hormones than the body needs, you may lose weight unexpectedly, hyperthyroidism. And so we, I talk from time to time about the bodybuilding forums. Uh, people that dabble in thyroid, they, they talk about how they love the way it makes them look. It makes them so skinny. But everybody, they also talk about how once you start messing with your thyroid, it's, they, they, you really, these people have a tough time stopping after that. 
because you start messing with your thyroid hormone, it starts, then it, it's tough to, then it doesn't, if you stop, now you, now you have, uh, it's, if you stop, uh, hypothyroid, oh, darn, did I not get it? Anyway, it's shown, and it's shown to, uh, as, as you might imagine, there's, there's, there's a bounce back. So if you give yourself too much, there, there's feedback mess mechanisms. So when you give yourself too much thyroid, now, now, now your body stops making as much, so it's a problem. So anyway, that, 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 that's just, uh, that's how it's working. Thyroid just makes you skinny. And uh, they're, they're putting thyroid right into the liver to say, let's make, let's make it skinny. And it's kind of working. So hypothyroid, so that's the idea. So hypothyroidism is associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH, specifically intrahepatic, remember hep hepatic, of course, uh, liver, intrahepatic hypothyroidism. So low thyroid inside the liver drives lipotoxicity, so toxicity from fats. So as you can imagine, it, it, if, if thyroid makes you skinny and not enough thyroid makes you fat, so this is, and, and, and the liver having too much fat is toxic, it's just a problem in itself. So not having enough thyroid makes your liver fat, drives lipotoxicity in preclinical models. Agonists of thyroid hormone receptor, uh, thyroid, thyroid hormone receptor beta, which is primarily found in the liver, can promote li like li lipophagy, uh, myco mitochondrial biogenesis, and mitophagy stimulate increase hepatic fatty acid beta actions, and thereby decrease in burden of lipidized lipids while promoting low-density lipid uptake and favorable uptake of lipid uptake. Okay, uh, that was a little too much, wasn't it? Okay, but that's how it works, and here is the results. So they went with stages uh, 1, B, 2, and 3, so not stage 4, which is cirrhosis, which is GALT has good results in, which is amazing. Uh, we're we're going to see you're not really supposed to be able to come back uh, from some of those per permanent so-called dam damage. Okay, so, a Nash, so here's Madrigal's results. NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis was achieved in 25.9% of patients, so NASH was resolved in 25.9% of patients on 80 milligrams and 29.9% on 100 milligrams versus 9.7 on placebo. Okay, pretty good. So it seems to be working somewhat for a quarter or so, but not doing, not being on the drug is working for 10% or so. Okay, fibrosis improvement by at least one stage with no worsening uh, was achieved in 24.2% and 25.9% versus 14.2%. So not quite as good. Uh, okay, they got good p-values though, and this also relates to cassava. They've got 966 patients in there. That's in between the rethink and refocus. There's like close to 800 and 1100 or something like that. And then look at the p-values. You need a 0 0.05 or better, lower. Uh, they got 0 0.001 in both of theirs. So that's good news. Just in, I mean, they're, they're, the Cassava knew what they were doing. They needed large enough trials to power it if, if it does work to show a good p-value. And they did that this just to show that it's about the same size. Those are really good p-values. But you're messing with your thyroid, so diarrhea and nausea were more frequent uh, with resmeratron than with placebo, but mostly it was safe. Uh, but anyway, I just think that Altimmune is a better, Altimmune and Viking, where they're taking the sugar out uh, at that earlier stage, is the better thing. Rather than messing with your thyroid, something as simple as just uh, a glucagon, which, which, which just, just releases the sugar into the blood where it's easy to get rid of, uh, it's just a simpler way better thing than messing with your thyroid, uh, in my opinion. Now, now they're on the market, but um, I don't think that they, they're really, uh, is, it, it, I don't think they're really uh, helping when they need help, which is when it get, things get fibrotic. So let's talk about fibrosis. The histologic spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so histologic means if you look through a microscope, the stages that, that you see, uh, from st simple steato steatosis, let's talk about steatosis, uh, I lost, I had to restart my machine. I lost all my, I hope I didn't lose all my highlighting. I have so much highlighting. I hope I didn't lose all my highlighting, goodness. Steatosis, uh, also called fatty change and abnormal retention of fat within a cell or organ. Steatosis most often affects the liver. So that's the retention of fat within it. We said in the liver, you have too much sugar. It stores too much sugar, then it spills over. Now it starts storing fat. Okay, so that's steatosis. Uh, so we go from simple steatosis to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So that's steato. So the, the, the fat is creating this hepatitis. That's inflammation of the liver. So that fa oh, that uh, fat accumulation of the liver is now pro progressed to inflammation of the liver from that fat. And then we go to fibrosis. We're going to talk all about fibrosis. So let's skip it for the moment, and then eventually get to cirrhosis. And cirrhosis 
definition of it. Cirrhosis is a condition in which your liver is scarred and permanently damaged. This is going on your permanent record. Scar tissue replaces healthy liver tissue and prevents your liver from working normally. As cirrhosis gets work worse, your liver begins to fail. So cirrhosis obviously uh, so associated with alcoholism, but you can have it with uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. Okay, so let's talk about this, this fibrosis. Fibrosis is a big deal in a lot of diseases. What is fibrosis? Fibrosis, also known as fibrotic scarring, is a pathological wound healing. So again, we see the immune system uh, overacting or bad acting causing a problem, just like in Alzheimer's. And we're going to see this in Alzheimer's. Uh, fibr also known as fibrotic scarring is a pathological wound healing in which connective tissue replaces normal parin, parin, I almost closed this. Look at this. Look what I got here. Parenchymal. Parenchymal. Which connective tissue replaces normal parenchymal tissue. Okay, what's parenchymal tissue? Parenchymal tissue is the functional part of an organ. Or, or structure, such as a tumor, but an organ, let's say. So the connective tissue is replacing the functional stuff. That's terrible news. So connective uh, tissue is replacing, what, nerve tissue or epithelial tissue or muscle tissue, whatever it is, not good stuff. Uh, and if this goes unchecked, it can lead to considerable tissue remodeling and the formation of permanent scar tissue. Repeated injuries or chronic inflammation so this is the idea is that it's path, it's pathological wound healing. So inflammation just creates this state of your immune system trying to heal wounds that aren't there. And it, what it does is it turns functional tissue into connective tissue. Repeated injuries, chronic inflammation, and repair are susceptible to fibrosis where an accidental excessive accumulation of extracellular matrix components, such as collagen, is produced by fibroblasts leading to the formation of permanent fibrotic scar. Let's remember that accumulation of extracellular matrix components. So that's, that's, this fibrotic scarring is the accumulation of extracellular matrix components. That's fibrosis, the accumulation of extracellular matrix. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, well, is this, is, uh, what diseases is this a problem in? Well, back here, it's going to say this is big in lungs, pulmonary fibrosis and idiopathic lung disease. Uh, idiopathic not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but another one, idiopathic, I can't remember the other one. Anyway, it's big in, in the, the, a lot of the lung diseases. It's the fibrotic scarring that's the big problem. Uh, it's big in the liver, big in the kidneys, brain, and heart, but also in scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, myelofibrosis, and system, systemic lupus, erythematosis. And these are, just to point out, these are big markets. And then we're going to talk about cancer, but uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. Rheumatoid arthritis is already, in 2022, is almost 25 billion. Crohn's in 2023 was almost 12 billion. Ulcerative colitis was more than 8 billion in 2022. So these are just huge, huge markets, just to point that out. Uh, another, so just this, that non-healing wound idea that of the inflammation. This is important in neuroinflammation, neuroinflammatory diseases like Alzheimer's we're going to see. And we're going to see that that beta amyloid is connective tissue. It is extracellular matrix components. It is fibrotic scarring. It is fibrosis. Chronic inflammation results in fibrosis. As cancer is a disease cr uh, of chronic inflammation mimicking a non-healing wound, similar mechanisms likely drive fibrosis in cancer. Indeed, chronic fibrosis predisposes to cancer initiation. <clears throat> so chronic inflammation results in fibrosis. Fibrosis results in cancer. So, just, so now we get into cancer. And so uh, the, the idea, so it, fibros, fibrosis and all these other things, but now uh, just having neuroinflammation leads to fibrosis, which leads to cancer. So, and then not only cancer in general, but melanoma. The mechanical pheno, phenotypic plasticity of melanoma cell, an emerging driver of therapy cross resistance. Advanced cutaneous melanoma is the deadliest form of skin cancer and one of the most aggressive human cancers. And in immune checkpoint, uh, immune checkpoint blockade therapy. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors have been a big one in melanoma, but they've been a breakthrough treatment. But in this context, mesenchymal like differentiated, differentiated melanoma cells, these mesenchymal cells are stem cells of connective tissue. 
So this, this has everything to do with fibrosis. Fibrosis is connective tissue being where functional tissue should be. Mesenchymal uh, cells are stem cells for connective tissue. So that is the, the beginnings of fibrosis. So in, the, so in this context, mesenchymal-like differentiated mesomelanoma cells exhibit a remarkable ability to autonomously assemble their own extracellular matrix and to biomechanically adapt in response to therapeutic insults, thereby fueling tumor relapse. So if, you, if they can't have a fibrotic environment, they'll just make one for themselves. They're making an a, 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 a extracellular, they're uh, autonomously assembling their own extracellular matrix. Okay, and so this, okay, so melanoma, anything else? Uh, why target the tumor stroma in melanoma? Stroma is this connective tissue. The cells and tissues that support, uh, oh, excuse me, the cells and tissues that support and give structure, give structure, yes, to support and structure, connective tissue. So not the functional stuff, the connective stuff, cells support and structure. So why target the cells? Why target that, that seemingly inert stuff? Again, targeting this just like with cassava, targeting the filament A. Why target that seemingly inert stuff? Recent evidence suggests that this resistance occurs when tumor cells. Uh, so the idea is that those tumor, those checkpoint inhibitors are working, but the tumors are learning and they're reacting. How are they reacting? By creating a fibrotic environment to get going again. So if you give, well, then maybe we could give a checkpoint inhibitor with something that uh, battles fibrosis, and they're doing that. Recent evidence suggests that this resistance occurs when tumor cells leave their microenvironment and migrate on a stiff, activated tumor stroma. That is, the resistance is linked to the presence of extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix, reminiscent of a fibrotic microenvironment. They're making uh, a fibrotic microenvironment. They make, they're making their own fibrotic environment, microenvironment, so they can uh, get going in creating more, getting going with their cancerous ways again. Okay, and then we have, uh, again, this, the idea that the, the, it is the connective tissue playing a big role in melanoma, but then we're going to see others. A close interrelationship between chronic fibrosis and cancer has been established for several malignancies between including breast and, can and pancreatic. So breast cancer is huge. Pancreatic is deadly. They both are deadly. In this context, the contribution of fibrosis to drug adaptation and therapy resistance of melanoma is rapidly emerging. So this resistance is, is related to fibrosis. Okay. I almost had a mini heart attack when I was thinking that these weren't highlighted because I'll never find that stuff again. Okay. And then... Now we get to, to fibrosis in Alzheimer's disease, and then we're going to get around to back to the liver, back to galactin again. But galactin, in addition to the liver, is doing melanoma. Uh, fibrotic scarring in neurodegenerative diseases. The process of uncontrolled internal scarring called fibrosis is now emerging as a pathological feature uh, shared by both peripheral and central nervous system diseases. In the central nervous system, damaged neurons are not replaced by tissue regeneration and scar forming cells such as endothelial cells, inflammatory immune cells, stromal fibroblasts, and astrocytes can persist chronically in the brain and spinal cord lesions. Rising evidence supports a double and apparently contrasting role of CNS scar in both promoting tissue protection as well as inhibiting repair. Okay, so the scar, uh, not only is just a problem in the first place, but then it, can, you, can you repair it? No, it actually stops the, re the repair as well. Indeed, scar-forming astrocytes have been extensively studied as regarded as one of the main sources of their axon growth inhibitory mechanism by acting as a physical barrier that delays rather than supporting axon regeneration. Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder characterized by the formation of plaques constituted by an excess of fibrous tissue in the brain. So we know Alzheimer's disease is uh, two of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, two of the three. Uh, there's more, I guess, but, uh, the, but the, uh, the glucose as well. Anyway, but, but two of the main ones anyway are uh, uh, amyloid plaque formation and inflammation, neuroinflammation. And now we know <coughs> neuroinflammation causes fibrosis. And look at this, the amyloid plaques are fib or mo mostly fibrotic. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder characterized by the formation of plaques constituted by an excess of fibrous tissue in the brain. Brain tissue from Alzheimer's disease patients indeed shows extensive deposition of extracellular beta amyloid aggregates accumulating into toxic fibrils. 
Okay, and then we have, look at, this is, this is pretty amazing. Moreover, parasites, so what are parasites? Parasites are cells persistent at intervals along the walls of capillaries in the central nervous system. They are important for blood vessel formation, maintenance of the blood-brain barrier, regulation of immune cell entry to the central nervous system, and control of brain blood flow. Well, the immune cells going into the central nervous system, my gosh, the microglia, the immune system having a huge role in, in Alzheimer's, and then the blood flow uh, having a with vascular dementia perhaps being interesting there as well. But anyway, this is look. This is really interesting. Moreover, parasites and vascular smooth muscle cells constitute the major cellular phenotypes expressing PDGFR beta. What the heck is that? Uh, Platelet-derived growth factor beta. Uh, these growth factors are mitogen's cells for the mesenchymal origin of mesenchymal origin. What's, what's the mesenchymal again? Oh, those stem cells of connective tissue. So, uh, the levels of the correlate, so the levels of this, uh, the levels of the biomarker for the stem cells of connective tissue correlate with clinical dementia rating in Alzheimer's patients. So, there you go. The fi there's a huge fibrotic component in Alzheimer's. In fact, biomarkers correlate, biomarkers of stem cells for connective tissue correlate with uh, clinical dementia rating in Alzheimer's. Pretty amazing stuff. Amyloid, so remember just amyloid beta beta amyloid plaques. Amyloid refers to the abnormal fibrous extracellular proteinaceous deposits found in organ and tissues. Amyloid's insoluble. Remember we always talk about how there seems to be when they're soluble, these proteins are useful, and when they're insoluble, they're not. Is insoluble and is structurally dominated by beta sheet structure, but uh, fi abnormal fibrous. And then, okay, can you do anything about this? The, what, this so I'm, I'm convinced fibrosis is a big problem in NASH, in cancer, in, our, uh, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, and ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, and, and uh, interstitial lung disease. That's what I couldn't think of. And idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and uh, all this other stuff. Uh, is there any way to deal with fibrosis? Well, there's this galactin-3 inhibition. What, okay, what is this? business. Galactin-3 is a beta-galactoside binding mammalian lectin. A lectin is a protein that binds to carbohydrates. By the way, this is from Journal of Biochemical Cellular Biology 2021. So galactin-3 is a lectin, so it is a, a protein that binds to carbohydrates. Galactin-3 lattice has been regarded as being crucial mechanism whereby extracellular galactin-3 modulates cellular signaling by prolonging retention time or retarding lateral movement of cell surface receptors in the plasma membrane. In multiple models of organ fibrosis, it has been demonstrated that galactin-3 is potently pro-fibrotic and modulates the activity of fibroblasts and macrophages in chronically inflamed organs. Increased galactin-3 expression also activates myofibroblasts resulting in scar formation and may therefore impact common fibrotic pathways lays, ways leading to fibrosis in multiple organs. Okay, so in, in okay, let's, let's just see some more. Okay, so increased galactin-3 expression uh, activates these things that form okay, the, the, uh, the scars. It's a big deal in the probiotic. Let's, there's going to be more... Uh, I'm just going to read it again. In multiple models of organ fibrosis have been demonstrated galactin-3 is potently pro-fibrotic pro and modulates the activity of fibroblasts and macrophages. We just saw how they were a part of this uh, process in chronically inflamed organs. Increased galactin-3 expression also activates myofibroblasts, resulting in scar formation and may therefore impact common fibrotic pathways leading to fibrosis. Okay, so this takes us to galactin therapeutics. Galactin has belapectin, it's got fast track designation. Low toxicity is a carbohydrate based molecule. It's a protein that binds carbohydrates. Already it doesn't sound too wacky. It doesn't sound like they're, they're messing with anything too wacky. They're, it just sort of sounds like they're messing with your digestion a little bit, or it doesn't sound like they're uh, doing anything too crazy. And it's, it's been shown safe. Uh, low toxicity, like you might expect. Good patent protection through 2035. Only company to exclusively focus on treatment of the cirrhotic stage of NASH 
because they're the only company that's really able to help in a way that you need help with. It, I'm not trying to be in, in sense of, but obesity, NASH, and uh, diabetes type 2, you can solve this with, with exercise and diet. Uh, but, one, but when you start dealing with fibrosis, it, it, there's, even if you, uh, like, it, there's, you can get fibrosis in your liver from fasting, it seems. The, 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 fa the fasting the wrong way or something like that can, uh, you would think it's so good for your liver to, uh, to get the stuff out of there, but, if you, but it can stress the liver and lead to scarring there too. So this fibrosis is just a problem in, in and of itself, and you need help with that, it seems. Encouraging clinical response and difficult to treat cancers in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, as we'll see. And then this is interesting, 20.4 20, 20 million in cash, 30 million remaining under line of credits provided by the chairman. This chairman is a self-made billionaire uh, in like industrial products, started a company like, went to Stanford, it's 1967, started a company like 1980, industrial product distribution, made billions. 40 years later, 50 years later, gosh, uh, 45 years later, he's in, he's in, uh, he, he's the chairman of Galectin and something like multiple times he's exercised convertibles like above, like, like Matt Nachtrab says he's going to do. He says he's going to exercise his warrants regardless. He, this guy has exercised convertibles. Talk about having the, the leadership in your corner and uh, management with incentives, uh, aligned to yours and, uh, being treated right by the the people that are running the company. I mean, this guy is uh, putting. He's he's not he's not uh, running this company to steal for him to try to steal from you. He's 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 he doesn't got, he's gonna he wants to see he wants this company to be seen through, and he doesn't he's not worried about a short term payday and things like that. So anyway, that's 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 just a good bullish endorsement. But it's also just good reason to think that this company will never be in the kind of cash trouble that uh, some other companies might be in. Uh, and now that I said that, though, Cassava has uh, their billionaire as well. <laughs> They've not had cash trouble, but they have gotten attacked. Anyway, here is Bella Pectin. It's in Nash Cirrhosis. So anyway, about that money, oh, that's not that much money. Well, it's not that much money, but it's, it, it'll last, and they have data coming on their phase two slash three. If this data is good enough, it'll be approvable. If it's not good enough, then it won't be. But if it's, if it's a good enough, it'll be approvable. That's data this year. So that's Bella Pectin and Nash. And by the way, they're doing Bella Pectin with Keytruda, one of those checkpoint inhibitors that was so revolutionary in melanoma. But the melanoma learns to fight back with the fibrotic environment. So this is a really interesting uh, combination. And that is... Uh, I lost part. I lost my uh, highlights on this one, so I got to find. Okay, so here is in their total patient population. This is HPVG hepatic vein. There's this. There's the guy Richard Uline, by the way. Where's picture went? Uh, or maybe, I guess that's not him. I guess that's just a random picture. But Richard Uline's the guy. And then hepatic. hepatic Vein, venous pressure gradient. So let's talk about cirrhosis one more time. Cirrhosis, condition in which your liver is scarred and permanently damaged. Scar tissue replaces healthy liver tissue and prevents your liver from working normally. As cirrhosis gets worse, your liver begins to fail. So these are, peop these are people that need help. They, this is in Bellopectin in patients with Nash cirrhosis. So they didn't do any of these people. Madrigal didn't try, didn't try in any of these people. This is sort of like cassava doing the moderates when Lily and Biogen wouldn't because it's tougher because your drug needs to work. Uh, obviously, this won't work because it's approved, but I just don't, I, I don't like the mechanism of action. I like, I like uh, galactins a lot better. Uh, Bella pectin reduced HPVG and Ultimunes as well uh, and Vikings and Behringers. Bella pectin reduced HPVG at week 54. Okay, so, eight, so hepatic vein pressure gradient. Port so portal hyper, so the big idea is this is a measure of uh, blood pressure in the liver. And the worst thing about cirrhosis is the blood pressure. So portal hypertension is a severe consequence of chronic liver diseases and is responsible for the main clinical complications of liver cirrhosis. Hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement is the best available method to evaluate the presence and severity of portal hypertension. And so these are, again, these are people that are so bad off, but their, their hyper, their cirrhosis, 
as measured by their uh, hypertension, is seeming to get better. It, 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 it got slightly better for the two drug groups as it got worse, like it's supposed to, and your liver fails and you die when you have cirrhosis. But these people are being helped. How about that? And then it was, it was in uh, patients without varices, so these varices form these little tubules, uh, plus 12% in placebo, and only points up 0.6% in the higher drug group, which is interesting, but down 8% in the uh, other drug group. So a really good effect. So it look, it's, a, it's a great idea, and it looks like it's working, and it looks like it can work in a lot of diseases. Okay. And then, remember this one, filament A is overexpressed in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and contributes to the progression of inflammation and fibrosis. That extracellular matrix, filament A links to, the from the inside of the cell, links to the, the uh, something on the outside of the cell that, uh, like, uh, nails down the extracellular matrix. I can't remember, but it's related to the extracellular matrix. And it's, they, it's shown, it's overexpressed. And so what I'm, what I'm going to say about all of that stuff is both galactin and cassava all the other possible indications are keys to them being taken out. I'm not saying they're just going to run trials and all that stuff, but uh, we, 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 the, the, there's so much else it applies to for both of them. And, that'll, and again, I, why, that, that'll be key for big pharma that needs to replace and, and have big drugs. I just think they're, both of those are, are good ones. Galactin in the meantime is almost flat down ever so slightly. Cassava, good job team, up over 21. XBI slightly up, and that is because the bonds are slightly up. All right. With that, my investing friends, let's go to the phones. Please like, liking, like. The algorithm likes, like, and you're going to like, liking, like. Uh, guided says, one-third likes only so many freeloading ingrates, which means ungrateful people. I had a teacher call one of my fellow students that one time. I looked it up. <laughs> Morning, Joe. Question about the 3,000 share price on cassava. Do you believe that 1,000 share price, 1,000 CVR, 1,000 in stock? Have a great weekend. Yes. So if we're if they're going to get a three, if they're going to get their value, I've said that uh, it seems like a, a split of all three. They get a big chunk of cash, a big chunk of shares, and then a big chunk of remaining upside. Or, yeah, CVR, which is a, just a contract, however you want to write it up, for profit sharing. So, yeah, profit sharing as well. So, yes, I, I, think, that's, I think that's how they get their full, the, the best value they're going to get. Which, I don't know if it'll be full value, but full value is probably close to a number I wouldn't even want to say. Wow, Madrigal is $5 billion market cap with a $260 stock price. Big things to come for Saba and Galectin, by the way. Galectin, their market cap is 120 they one sixtieth, they're one fiftieth the, the price of Madrigal. It makes no sense. They have data this year that, that could, that's approvable in, in NASH. That makes no sense. Thanks for that, Guided. I've been following biotech news on LinkedIn. I've been following biotech news on LinkedIn, and I'm seeing AstraZeneca doing acquisitions every week or so. It must be loaded on cash. They all are. They have tons of cash. Had to look at Galt's Yahoo forum. Same deal. Interested by shorts and fudsters. Infested by shorts and fudsters who bought high and sold low. Some poor suckers sold right before the approval. Hilarious. That's uh, typical stuff. Thank you for that, my friend. Keith, good to see you, my friend. Been a while. Hey, Joe, when you are searching for new stocks, do you count the number of competitors before you dive into a particular stock? If so, what is the maximum number of competitors you will withstand? Yes, you got to look at the competitors. More than uh, just looking at the number of competitors, we talk about the idea of not going after a well-validated target, but having your own idea. So like in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there's some target, I forget what it is, but like 30 companies, it's a well-validated target. Everybody knows it's going to work at least to some degree. So 30 companies are going after it. Uh, I wouldn't mind a, a Duchenne, I don't care if there's 30 competitors, if somebody else has a different idea that, that seems like it might work and it seems like they're, they're not getting any value for it. So the idea of a novel thinking for yourself and coming up with a not for sure, not that well-validated idea where, where there just hasn't been tons and tons of research on it, but it looks to you like it's going to work. 
that kind of thing uh, can you know can blow the, can leave the competitors in the dust at least. Uh, you're the only one doing that. So, uh, good question, my friend. All right, good to see you guys. We'll do it again on Monday. And I got a great stock coming for you this weekend. Uh, great multi bagger stock. Uh, another uh, biotech. I'm actually choosing between two at the moment. So I have, I have two really good ones uh, related to some of the things we've been seeing. But at this point, just about everything I'm looking at is related to something we've seen. We, we've talked about so many biotechs. All right, great to see you guys. We'll do it again on Monday, and I'll see you in the Discord. Have a great night. Sign up uh, for the newsletter in the description, and I'll see you in the Discord. Alex says, any thoughts on whether Sava will submit application in 52-week uh, phase three trial is great? Yes. Uh, Lindsay has even said uh, that, that the FDA has said that they, that they prefer two, but that one is, is approvable. And I'm sure the guidance says that, or just the history says that, but that one is approvable if uh, the data is good enough. And the, they've said repeatedly in their uh, 10K that a completed phase two and a uh, ongoing or well-designed phase three is approvable. So not completed, but well, they've been saying that all along, which we've been hoping meant there that we could break through their CMS of the approval, which it should have been. But now I guess it will take it to mean that first phase three is approvable and they don't need both of them. All right. Great to see you guys. We'll do it again. Uh, would that application be made public? An NDA would most certainly be made public. Uh, yeah, a new drug application is different than a breakthrough therapy uh, designation application. So yeah, if, if they were applying, they would announce it. If they were, uh, if they have, if they have great data on phase one, they'll have, have a conference call almost certainly and say we're really happy with this, and we're going to talk to the FDA, and uh, we're cautiously optimistic that this is approvable. Is probably what we're expecting to hear. All right, I uh, will see you guys on Monday. See you in the Discord. I'll see you over the weekend in the newsletter and then in the Discord. Have a great night. See you in the Discord.